Okay, this then raises the question, going to the next slide. Um, should we target such civilian targets? Well, I'm going to go to the next slide uh, and the next after that. Well, the short answer is no, in my opinion, but you know, other people have other opinions. But you, I want you to understand why we even think about doing such things. Uh, and that is, in the old days, 80 years ago, we couldn't get within um, 75 square miles of our intended point targets. Uh, it, we had uh, CEPs of five miles uh, back in 41. And if you take uh, the, the formula for CEP is uh, pi r squared, where r is the radius of a circle defined as uh, the circle within which half of the weapons closest to, to the intended target fall. So that means half of the CEP of 75 square miles means the rest, half of the bombs don't even get within 75 square miles. <laughs> Next chart. Solution. If that's your accuracy, what do you bomb? Well, something is really big uh, that doesn't, you know, generally fly up a whole lot of defenses at you at night, and it's a lit city. And so this is where we went after we tried to hit point targets in 1940 and 42. We went for just killing a lot of people in cities and saying, well, it must have some military value. And arguably it did. And since that's all we could do, I guess, well, that's you know, what we're doing. But over to the right, we have the firebombing of Tokyo as the logical conclusion and follow through. And you know, that killed 100,000 people. And you know, it was over a matter of 48 hours. That then leads to the next slide. <laughs> OK. So the logical projection and follow through was, oh, well, why, why do uh, area bombing with a lot of bombers? It seems like a waste of perfectly decent fuel. We can go with one bomber and, you know, just be done with it. And, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were just basically a follow through, a, a more efficient way of doing what we were already doing. Uh, go back now, if you could, Bailey, uh, to the previous slide. So. Um, what we did then, roughly, was to make up for aiming inaccuracies, we just went wild increasing explosive yields. So we went from, the biggest bomb in the Second World War was called the Grand Slam, and it had an effective yield of about four tons. And what we did is we went from glam, Grand Slam of 40 tons to 1,500 tons and then 20 hundred tons. So that's a pretty big jump. That's going from non-nuclear to nuclear. You went to 15 kilotons or 15,000 tons from just about four tons. And of course, with the um, Hiroshima bomb, we, we then jumped to the uh, uh, hydrogen bombs. And they were, you know, instead of 15 kilotons, they were 15 million tons. Now, you don't really get a sense looking at this chart that these jumps were significant because it's logarithmic paper. But if you did this on a, just a sort of arithmetically or on a linear kind of chart, uh, I mean, I don't know, you'd have to go to the top of the Washington Monument to, to do this chart. <laughs> There's pretty significant jumps here. All right, so let's go forward. The to the one. next slide beyond this. All right, now, initially, um, the whole idea of using uh, bombers to kill lots of people didn't go away after the Second World War. Uh, I mean, first of all, in the North Korean War, we dropped more bombs on it than the entire campaign in the Second World War. Uh, Curtis LeMay bragged that he had destroyed or killed 10 to 20% of the population, which is one to two million people. And everything on the surface of North Korea was flattened. That's the reason they have like, I don't know, 10, 20,000 tunnels uh, now. They don't like that vulnerability. Um, but you'll notice to the right, even when we developed uh, the next bomb, the hydrogen bomb, 
Uh, the aim was literally just to destroy more of the city than we could with that little circle, which that was the atomic or fission bomb of a nominal yield of 10 to 20 kilotons. So, you know, if you go down to the bottom chart, moreover, we had about half of our arsenal in multi-megaton uh, yield weapons into the early 70s. So this whole idea of MAD and effectively destroying an awful lot of targets that might have had military value, but would kill a whole, you know, literally millions or scores of millions of, and maybe even hundreds of millions in the early years, uh, was de rigueur. I mean, it was part of the, the narrative. Uh, massive assured destruction was a little thing that was coined to try to summarize the mentality of what the effective uh, consequences of doing the single integrated operating plan, which was this massive spasm of releasing, you know, thousands of weapons on, on your adversary. What's happened since, go back to that accuracy chart, uh, if you would, Bailey. One more. Uh, oh, I guess we didn't do that, the accuracy. Oh, go, go back further. Oh, it's back there. I know it's back there. Go back. There we go. Well, what happened in, in 1941 uh, was we had a, a CEP of 75 square miles. Uh, by 2011, it was down to a few meters. And today, well, now let's go forward to that car. The today with precision guidance, innocence need not suffer. It's now down to about a yard. Here is a car that was hit with something called the flying jinsu. And this uh, weapon was able to not, well, well, was able to hit one individual in the car. The driver opened the door and walked out. Now that is precision. And it puts things in an entirely different light with regard to the killing of innocents. You do not have to do it as much because you have aiming accuracies. All right, let's go to the next slide. 